Well, if y'all would turn with me today to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 34 through 38 today, Luke chapter 1, 34 through 38. Many years ago, I was teaching a class of third to fifth graders in Awana, it's a program in church, and we had several core truths about Jesus that we were going through. Lessons like Jesus is the Savior, Jesus is the Messiah. But one lesson that I taught to these children shocked them, confused them as well. The lesson was, Jesus is God. They were shocked by that. Third through fifth graders. And I got to wondering, how did they not know that Jesus is God. You see, these children had grown up in church. These children had parents that were faith, faithful followers of Christ. These children were in a church where the Word was clearly preached. So what happened? Where was the disconnect that they did not know that Jesus is fully God? Now maybe their parents and their teachers and their pastor, maybe they just assumed that the children knew. We can't assume anything. We need to make sure that our children know who Jesus is. We need to make sure that when we're sharing our faith, that people know who Jesus is. And I think in church sometimes we can kind of become desensitized to the glorious truth that Jesus is God. We need to be very purposeful in teaching that Jesus is fully God and fully man. We need to be diligent in teaching because there are many false teachings about Jesus out there right now. You probably pass by some of these false churches like the Jehovah Witnesses who believe that Jesus was the Michael, uh, Michael the Archangel that became a man. Or like the Mormons who believe that Jesus is the eldest of God's spirit children. But they believe that the Father, that He also had parents and that He was a man who became God and that He had sexual relations with Mary for Jesus to be born. That's what the Mormons teach. And then the Muslims, they believe that Jesus was a great prophet, but they do not believe that He is God. There are many others that believe that Jesus is just a great prophet teacher. Christian scientists, they believe that Jesus, or that Jesus was a man who was possessed by the Spirit of Christ and that we need to understand how to be possessed by the Spirit of Christ as well. And then there's still some people who believe that Jesus was just a magician or maybe that he even didn't exist at all. See, there's false teachers all around us. Jesus is God, and that matters. If He is not God, He should not be worshipped. If He is not God, He cannot save us. If He is not God, He cannot hear your prayers. If He is not God, He doesn't love you because He doesn't even know who you are. But here's the glorious truth. Jesus is God, and He is to be worshipped. He can save you. He does hear your prayers, and He loves you and knows each and every one of you. Jesus is God. This is Luke chapter 1, verse 34 through 38. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, 
Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Father, thank you for the glorious truth that Jesus, God the Son in the flesh, came to save us from our sins. Thank you for the glorious truth that with you nothing is impossible. Help us to remember that when we pray for our lost loved ones. Help us to remember that when we struggle with doubts, with temptations, with difficulties in life. Help us to remember who you are, Lord, and how you have revealed yourself to us through your word, by the prophets, by your spirit, and in these last days by your son. Father, thank you that we know that Jesus is fully God and fully man. In the holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. As we pick up our passage today, Gabriel the angel has arrived in Nazareth and has spoken to Mary, a virgin who was engaged to marry Joseph. And Mary has been told that she would have a child. And this child is the long-awaited Messiah, the Davidic King of Kings. But Mary asks a very plain question. How can this be since I do not know a man? You see, the miracle of Christmas is not the birth of Jesus. It's the conception of Jesus. For you see, Mary was a virgin. A supernatural occurrence was about to happen. But we see that nothing is impossible with the Creator. And Gabriel asks, answers her question. Here's how. Here's how you will be pregnant with the Messiah through a creative act of the Holy Spirit. This is not a sexual encounter. No, not like these pagan myths where the gods come down and have sexual relations with women. It's not like the blasphemy of the Mormons who say that God the Father had sex with Mary. No, this is a creative act of the Holy Spirit. A miracle. And as we look at verse 35, we see this is a very Trinitarian verse. We see God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this one verse. See, the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. The Holy Spirit shall come upon you. This is a creative act of conception. And the Father will overshadow you. The power of the highest and the eternal Son of God, that is Jesus Christ, will be miraculously united with flesh. And it says in this passage that He will be a holy one. He will be holy in the flesh because He is born of the Holy Spirit. Breaking the curse of Adam. Jesus had no earthly father. Joseph adopted him, but Joseph Joseph was not his true father. But Jesus, God the Son, is already holy. He always has been holy because He is God. And in this passage we see that He is called the Son of God. And that is because He is of the same nature as God the Father. We see in this birth the uniting of divine and human flesh together. Through a virgin, God has given a sign of Emmanuel. God with us. Now look at Jesus. Jesus has shown that He is God. He has demonstrated that through His attributes. Think about as he walked the earth, as he controlled nature, walking on the sea, calming the storm, multiplying fish and bread, as he was healing sicknesses, as he was raising the dead, as he was knowing the thoughts of men around him, as he was forgiving people of their sins. Jesus showed others that he is God. And as we dig into the New Testament, We find over and over again the proof 
that Jesus is God. For one, he is referred to as Theos, the Greek word for God, seven times very explicitly in the New Testament. In John, it starts out, in the beginning was the Word, talking about Jesus Christ, the Word who became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. One occurrence. Also in John, later on in the first chapter, he says, no one has ever seen God, referring to the Father. The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. That passage is telling us that nobody has seen God face to face except for God, Jesus, who has made the Father known to us. The third occurrence is also in the book of John. After Jesus rose from the dead, and Thomas, who had not seen the resurrected Lord yet, wanted to see the prints in his hands and the slash in his side to know that it was truly Jesus who had risen from the dead. And Jesus came before Thomas, and Thomas fell and answered, My Lord and my God. Third occurrence. And then in the book of Romans, Paul talks about that Jesus was born of the Jews according to the flesh. Christ came, who is over all. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. The eternally blessed God. Amen, he says. And in the book of Titus, Paul says we should live holy lives looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, but to the Son He says, Your throne, O God, this is the Son, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Jesus rules forever, righteously. And then in the book of 2 Peter, Simon Peter, a close disciple of Jesus Christ, says, Simon Peter, a bondservant or a slave, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us. So he's writing to this church. They have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you think the New Testament is trying to tell us something about Jesus' identity? Well, if you even go to the Old Testament, there's one clear passage in Isaiah 9 and 6, and you're going to hear this one at Christmas time. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus is God. But it doesn't just stop with the word theos. Also, as you go into the New Testament, you find Jesus referred to kurios several times. This is the word for Lord. The Greek word that was used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was already completed before Jesus arrived on the scene. 6,814 times in the Old Testament, this word for Lord is where they're translating God's name Yahweh. God's name that He has clearly revealed to the people of Israel. Yahweh. Now, the word Lord can be used for sir or master as well. But in the New Testament, we find that 400 times Lord is used to describe Jesus. Do you know that saying? Jesus is Yahweh in the book of Luke. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Jesus is Yahweh. And in Matthew 3.3, 3, John the Baptist is preparing the way for the Lord making his path straight. This is referring back to the book of Psalms. And who is the Lord that he's preparing the way for? But Yahweh. And who is it that John, Bab John the Baptist is preparing the way for? It is Jesus. He is God. And in the book of Hebrews, it says, And you, Lord, you, Yahweh, you, Jesus, in the beginning lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Jesus, the Creator, 
everlasting, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It goes further than just theos and kurios. It goes on to ami. Now, ami means I am. And throughout the book of John, you see that John uses I am to refer to Jesus. It is the name that God revealed to Moses in the burning bush. I am who I am. I am the self-existing, always existing God of all things. I am. Now Jesus, as He's speaking to the Jewish people, He says, if you keep My words, you will never see death. When they hear that, they're like, well, wait a minute. Abraham and the prophets, they're dead. They're dead. What are you talking about? You keep my word, you'll never see death. And then Jesus goes on and says, but Abraham has rejoiced to see my day. And he has seen it. For he saw in the birth of his own son the continuation of what God had promised. To bless all nations through Abraham. But when, they, when he said that, the Jews scoffed at him. They said, you're not even 50 years old and you say this like you've seen Abraham? Oh, but Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Do you know what Jesus was saying? I am God. I have always existed. I am self-existing. I am before Abraham. John goes on several passages in the book of John. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger and who believes in me shall never thirst. You know, we need food to live, don't we? If you don't have food, you die. And Jesus says that He is the true bread from heaven. I am the bread of life. If you want eternal life, you must accept Jesus Christ. Further in John, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Jewish people are waiting for the Messiah to be the light, the light in the world, cutting through the darkness, for the darkness cannot consume the light. And Jesus says, I am that light. He is God. Later in John, he says, I am the door. He is the door of the sheep. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Through Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. And it is only through Jesus Christ. He is God. He says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. The cross, this is exactly what Jesus has done. He has given his life as a substitute for us. He is God. And Jesus said later in John, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. What a great promise from God the Son in the flesh. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live eternal life. Later in John, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How do you get to heaven? Through Jesus Christ. How are you saved? Through Jesus Christ alone. He is God. And Jesus says, I am the vine. He is the true vine. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. You cannot please God without faith. You must trust Jesus Christ as you abide in Him. You bear good fruit. Without Jesus, you can do nothing. Jesus is God. He is God. And as you go through the Gospels, you see that Jesus refers to Himself as the Son of Man 84 times. Actually, more than he refers to himself as the Son of God. Now, that title may not automatically make you think that he's saying that he is God. But that's absolutely what he's talking about. When you go to the seventh chapter of Daniel, Daniel sees a vision of an eternal world ruler coming from heaven. 
who has the kingdom, he's over it all. The King of kings and Lord of lords. Who is this eternal world ruler from heaven that we should worship? It is a one like the Son of Man. And Jesus says, I am the Son of Man. By a creative act of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit came upon Mary. The power of the highest overshadowed her, and she became the mother of God the Son. For God became flesh and dwelt among men. Can you imagine what's going through Mary's mind as she hears this from the angel? It's not impossible. God's going to do it. And the angel shares something with her in verse 36. Another miracle has already taken place. Your relative, Elizabeth, in her old age, the one who was barren, they didn't think she would ever have children. She is six months pregnant. And you can imagine Mary thinking, well, that's amazing. But Elizabeth has a husband, right? I'm not married. How could it be? In verse 37, the angel says, For with God nothing will be impossible. Do you know that? For with God nothing will be impossible. If you believe that it's not possible that a virgin could conceive, you don't believe the God of the Bible. For God has revealed Himself as the uncreated Creator who can do anything. Everything in creation belongs to the Creator. He is the designer, the architect, the sustainer. He has all the resources and power He needs to do anything. His holy will is absolutely unstoppable. Jesus is God. What a great truth. Jesus is God, and with God nothing is impossible. I want you to think about that. Nothing is impossible. That means salvation for your wayward son is possible. That means the healing of your illness is possible. That means strength through this trial is possible. But maybe you're thinking about your situation. You say, it's too late. There's no way. There's no way. It's the attitude of Martha as Jesus came to Lazarus' tomb. Lazarus has been dead for four days. And Jesus says, roll that stone away. And Martha says, no, Lord, he stinketh. He's dead. There's no way you're too late. You know, if only you had been here in time. They roll that stone away. And Jesus calls to him, Lazarus, come forth. For nothing is impossible with God. He says, believe, and you will see the glory of God. Jesus is God. And with Jesus, nothing is impossible. All things are made through Him. And in Him is life. That life is the light of men. Jesus, the Lord, saves. We need to trust Him and submit to Him. And look at verse 38 with me. It's exactly what Mary did. She trusted and submitted her life to Him. She said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. She trusted God and she was willing to submit to God's plan. What a great testimony of faith. Even in the midst of uncertainty, she trusted God. Even in the middle of fear, she trusted God. Even when she could not understand everything that was going on, she trusted God. And she adjusted her life to His will. Have you done that? Have you submitted to God's plan? Or are you trying to control your life? Even, even though you know that it's displeasing to the Lord. Have you submitted to Him? He's called you to obedience. But maybe you resisted. Where is life but in Jesus Christ? Do you believe that with God nothing is impossible? Or do you doubt that He can help your situation? That He can help your health, your temptations, your trials? Who is Jesus? Do you trust Him? 
Do you know that He is able? Because He is God. The uncreated Creator put on flesh. And He gave His life as a ransom for sin. He rose from the dead and He is alive forevermore. And now He says, Come to Me all ye who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest for My yoke is easy and My burden is light. He who has the Son has eternal life. But he who does not have the Son shall not see life for the wrath of God abides on him. Here's the good news. Even though we are sinners, God has provided a way for us to be saved. And that is through Jesus Christ, God the Son in the flesh. Jesus is God and He is worthy of worship. Jesus is God and He can save you completely. Jesus is God and He can hear your prayers. Jesus is God and He loves you and He knows you. Give Him the glory that is due to Him. And be purposeful. Purposeful in telling others that Jesus is God. Father, thank You for Your Word today. I thank You that we can rest. That we can have peace. We can have assurance. Because we know that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Father, there are many things that we do not understand. There are many things that are hard for us to comprehend. And we can imagine just as Mary, that sometimes we have doubts, we have struggles, we don't understand. But we know that you are in control and that your way is best. And Father, as we look at the glorious truth of the Trinity, one God in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Father who is not the Son, who is not the Spirit, the Son who is not the Father who is not the Spirit. The Spirit who is not the Father who is not the Son. But all fully God. And now we know Jesus. God with us. Who has walked among men. Who has lived a sinless life. And who has given His life as a ransom for our sins. As a substitute. And now if we trust Jesus Christ, we can be forgiven we can be saved. We can receive eternal life. Father, help us to glorify you, to trust you, to adjust our lives to you, and help us to tell others the glorious truth that Jesus is God. In the holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.